Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I, uh, I feel very privileged to be here today. I'm Alex Osala. I'm the Deputy Special Projects Editor at Quartz. Um, and I feel very fortunate because it was certainly an education for me to be able to even ask these questions that I'm going to be up here for. Um, you know, usually my job as a journalist is to act as a stand-in for the reader or listener in this case. And uh, you all have like such a higher level of competency in this field than I do. So apologies if I'm like coming in a little bit uh, below your knowledge level. But uh, I'm also grateful that Evan did a lot of the introducing that I was going to do. So you all now know what synthetic data is. Great. We don't have to get into that. Um, and I was going to introduce the panelists, but they have already been introduced. Uh, <laughs> uh, would you actually, would you guys like to just say your names and your affiliations real quick before we get into it? Yes, so my name is Lourdes Agapito, not Agapitos, as it says there. Um, I'm a professor of 3D computer vision at UCL, University College London, um, and I'm also co-founder and scientific advisor at Synthesia, the company that produces um, synthetic media. So we um, synthesize videos, and you've just seen an example that Evan just showed earlier. Great. Uh, so, okay. My name's Dale. Uh, I'm the CEO of AI Reverie. Uh, my background's also in machine learning, and our company is focused on solving some very difficult, mission-critical uh, computer vision challenges using sy synthetic data. I'm, I'm Sergey. Um, apart from my academic work, which is indeed in the Steklov Institute of Mathematics in St. Petersburg, Russia, I'm also the chief research officer of Neuromation, a company which is actually sponsoring this summit and uh, which specializes in synthetic data. So that's why I'm here. Thank, uh, thank all three of you for coming from near and far to be here. Um, Sergey, let's, let's start with something pretty basic here. So what is the advantage of using synthetic data versus real world data? Well, there are plenty, <laughs> but to, 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 to list just a few. <clears throat> First of all, in many situations you cannot get real world data. So, for example, in medical imaging, if you have a rare condition, you might have a lot of uh, you, might, you might have a lot of images, a lot of medical Im images for some common conditions, but for a, for something rare, you might have like one, two, or five images, and that's it. And here, synthetic data can help uh, extend your data, so it can help you know uh, generalize this to other possible backgrounds and other possible environments. That's one. Two, uh, real data is usually very expensive. So it's not, it, it might not be that expensive to obtain, but for many problems it's very expensive to label. So if you think about, for example, segmentation, uh, for the segmentation problem where you need to recognize, where you need to recognize a silhouette of, of an object and to, to produce the segmentation mask for, or from, from, a, from a photograph, uh, labeling, manual labeling would be to actually, uh, you know, uh, produce the segmentation masks by hand or at least modify them by hand after they have been pr done by a simpler model. And that's really expensive and really time consuming. So here, again, synthetic data is much better because it, if, if you have a synthetic image which was generated by yourself, you know exactly what every pixel is, you know exactly what it's doing, and you know exactly which object it belongs to, and so on. And sometimes for other problems, you simply cannot do manual labeling. For example, for depth estimation, if you want to know the distance to camera, uh, a human being is not that good at labeling it, you know. And here again, in synthetic data, you know everything. Right. So. Makes a lot of sense. Lots of advantages here, but but Lourdes, what is what's the biggest challenge in creating synthetic data? So th the biggest challenge is, of course, that the synthetic data has to mimic the real data. So it has to have the same distribution. For instance, if we're talking about generating new images, um, they have to they have to look like the images that are that are real. So maybe they have to span a set of different lighting effects. Um, so they really have to capture the statistics of the image data sets that we then want to test those, um, those uh, algorithms that we've trained them with on. Um, so that, that's if we, you know, if we think about synthetic data, generating synthetic data for training. Um, of course, there, there are ways around this. So we can do domain adaptation. So now you can use uh, generative adversarial networks that will take 
um, synthetic images and they will make them look more like, like real images. So you can bridge this gap between synthetic and, and real data. Um, from my point of view, I think um, you know, we, we are getting pretty good at generating synthetic data, but there's one domain where perhaps there's still a big, big challenge, which is video. Um, so whereas we might be able to create still images that, that look pretty convincing, uh, when we go to video, we also have to capture the dynamics. And that's something where I think you know, some of the, the big uh, advances have to be done in, in the next few years. Um, yeah, so, so really capturing dynamics and being able to make those look real. Sure, yeah, actually that touches on the question I was gonna ask Dale as well. Um, so in, in your opinion, is synthetic data as good as real world data and what will it take for to close that gap? Yeah, so I think like the previous uh, response actually touched on a lot of really great points there about what makes or how you can make synthetic data better. Uh, I would just add to that, I mean, I think it's also useful to think about <clears throat> Uh, narrow versus general AI. So in our own work uh, and, and stuff that we've been involved in, uh, we found that like the more narrow the AI problem, meaning the more focused, the less variability there is in that. Uh, we've been able to just train entirely on synthetic data and beat almost anything out there just on that. And, and one example might be like pill recognition, uh, something that's like, you know, just scattered on a tray and the pills you can sort of model in a really nice way, change the lighting condition, all those things. So, and what we found is that as you start going into more harder, difficult challenges, well, what synthetic data does is that it offsets the amount of need for real data. And so you might not be able to just train completely on synthetic data, but you might not need, you know, might, you might be able to use uh, eighty percent less real data with the synthetic data, and if you add in things like domain randomization and domain adaptation for those who don 't know those ideas are just algorithmic ways of transferring the sort of real image statistics onto the synthetic data so fancy style transfers things like that that helps a lot um, so i think I think we 're getting there i mean it 's just going to take some time, but I mean the power uh, you know as you were saying that, I mean, there's so many advantages of synthetic data over real data in terms of just the flexibility and the, what you can do with it. So uh, I think it's just a matter of time. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and this is actually a question for all three of you. Sergey, maybe we can start with you and go this way. Uh, what is the larger effect of synthetic data on the industry overall? Well, I would, I would have to say that synthetic data, first of all, lets us tackle the problems that real data does not exist for. And as I already mentioned, for some problems it's impossible to label, for some problems it's simply very expensive and not worth it to label the real data set. And for some problems we have very little real data and then, yes, you, you can augment it with synthetic data and get much, much improved results from the hybrid data sets that you get. So, yeah, I would, I would say that uh, synthetic data makes the whole industry go places it couldn't, couldn't go with real data only. Yeah, so just to add to that, uh, you know, just to touch upon this notion of democratization that synthetic data can do, um, a lot of the sometimes challenges we don't tackle are due to financial constraints, just because the data is so expensive to label and train and even collect in certain instances. So I think, you know, let's say you're trying to, you're interested in the problem of wildlife conservation. Um, you know, most people are not going to look at that problem and be like, yes, this is the most lucrative opportunity I can possibly get into. But it can open up doors by being able to use synthetic data and to say, okay, great, I can now tr create this data a lot more cheap, cheaply and then be able to tackle those kinds of problems that people might have not have tackled because of the financial constraints there. So, so just maybe to cover something that, that, that hasn't been um, spoken about before. Um, so we, we work in synthetic media, which is um, generating new images and generating new videos. Um, and giving, so, so giving creators an opportunity to modify their video so that they can show something a bit different that the first original video maybe wasn't intended for. Um, so, you know, this, this is actually empowering uh, creators through AI to create, um, so, so to create new videos and to create and synthesize new videos. So we just show, show um, Evan showed before that video of himself um, talking in different languages, right? Um, so only one video was shot for that, and then that video was transformed. 
Um, and that video was then resynthesized so that we could make him speak in lots of different languages. Um, so just imagine, you know, that this could be a, a new art form. It could be a new way of, uh, of people to express themselves and to change the video that was originally uh, shot and, and to, to say new things, to reach more a wider audience. Um, so I think, you know, the potential of synthetic media is, is also great in, in that respect. Now, something that comes up a lot in what I cover is talking about ethical issues, which, of course, if you're talking about something that a computer generates, then certainly there are plenty of things to worry about if that's what you're into. Um, can you just talk about, each one of you, what is an ethical issue that you think the field is going to have to address moving forward? Should I begin? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, I'd, well, I'd like to say that actually it's precisely the ethical issues that are driving the synthetic data in some places. Because uh, for some applications, uh, you maybe you do have the data, but you don't want to release it. And again, the healthcare industry comes into mind. For example, your uh, hospital might have a large collection of, I don't know, uh, diagnoses, medical images, etc. but it cannot really release them to the public, right? It cannot release them to the researchers uh, except under some very strict conditions that are very hard to manage. And uh, in this situation, what they can do is they can try to generate synthetic data which matches the distribution of the real data they have and then release that. And this kind of privacy-preserving uh, synthetic data generation has al already, is already uh, an active area of study, and people ha have been working to, you know, formally preserve privacy in the synthetic data sets that they create. And historically, I think that was actually one of the first applications of synthetic data. I think the first papers on synthetic data were about generating medical records. Yeah, and that was before vision, that was in like early 1990s. So, yeah, so I, I would say that synthetic data helps solve ethical problems, not present them. Yeah, I mean, this is... One of those things where I know I know it's it's it sucks when somebody turns it around like that, but I agree with him. I, I actually think synthetic data is a more ethical thing because you know in many ways I think of it essentially as a canvas, right? I mean it's it's, it's a very powerful piece of technology, um, and you can do what you want, you can simulate what you want, and you can create what you want. So it's our choice as a society how we use it to do good things, and so. With that in mind, I mean, you know, with real data sets, there's all sorts of biases, and as you might have seen in the news, issues around the data, data selection and biases around that, that keep reinforcing biases. Synthetic data is a way to break out of that. Um, and so I think we have to be, you know, cognizant of what it can unleash, but that's a choice we have to make and we have to decide through conversation and debate. So I think with synthetic data comes big, big responsibility. Um, so, for instance, if we think about creating synthetic data for training, um, you know, we, so ver very often data is collected in a way that doesn't actually reflect, for instance, the diversity in society. So there might be groups in society, ethnicities that are underrepresented. Um, so when we collect this real data, those biases actually crop up. When we create synthetic data, those biases might also crop up. Um, so when we create synthetic data, we, we, we really have to... Have, there, there must be great responsibility from, from everybody who's involved in, in creating these data sets. Um, when we create synthetic data for you know, creating new media or for entertainment, um, that's, again, another area in which we, we have to apply responsibility. And I think that... Um, you know, many, many companies uh, are now taking, take, taking this very, very seriously. Uh, so, you know, there are now foundations, uh, companies are coming together to create ethical codes. So, for instance, to say, um, you know, in our company, for instance, we will never reenact anybody who hasn't given consent, for instance. So these kind of things, or authentication, you know, how can we actually uh, detect forgeries? How can we authenticate a user 
um, who has actually used a, a particular method uh, to, to change or synthesize new data. So all of these things have to be discussed, as you were saying, by society, by the creators, by innovators, and we have to come up with new, new codes and we have to come up with new standards, but we all have to engage in that conversation. Yeah, it, it is heartening that those kinds of conversations are top of mind and, and are certainly seeming to start to happen. Um, and, and I want to kind of shift to direct applications. Each of you has kind of touched on one in particular, but could you talk a little bit about what you're most excited about of all these many seemingly infinite applications for synthetic data and synthetic media? Um. Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this for another. No. Uh, so, um, you know, for us as, as a company, we're really excited about uh, particular issues around security and, and public security, being able to detect like school shootings, things like that. And one of the challenges that you referenced to is a sort of video, right? And so, you know, one of the things we're interested in is using motion capture and being able to create uh, the perfectly annotated activity data that's so hard to sometimes label manually. So we're really excited about being able to capture activity uh, in terms of one of the areas of technologies. I think that's going to be a lot of really, um, we're going to sort of see some cool algorithms being de developed with the ability to create that data. So, Okay. Uh, for us, Neuromation as a company began with a project in retail. So our first project was very straightforward object recognition, you know, recognize objects on supermarket shelves, obvious applications for retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was th th this was uh, the first project when we went into that. We did not really think we would use synthetic data, but it turned out that it's although it is a very straightforward task and real data would solve it, it turned out that it was simply impossible to get enough real data. It was just impractical to label all of this. And that, that's why we did the synthetic way here, and it worked. And that, that was how we actually went into synthetic data. And now we are working on, for example, using synthetic data for face recognition. And here, this is more about uh, actually filling, filling in the gaps in the data distribution, about augmenting an existing data set, making it more diverse, covering you know, angles that you don't get, or ethnicities that you don't get, and uh, everything like that. Uh, we are also working on, again, straightforward segmentation object recognition, but for uh, other, in other domains, like uh, we are working with a medical company to recognize uh, surgical instruments being put back into their boxes. And that is, again, uh, a very reasonable application for synthetic data. They're easy to do 3D models of, and it's hard to get enough real data, and that's, it. that's the kind of applications we're looking at. So the, the kind of applications that, that excite me, um, so related to, to Synthesia, to our company, are, you know, right now, if you think about the visual effects industry, so how films are made, um, you have to spend millions and millions of dollars just to get a few seconds, for instance, of a, a, a digital actor, right? So, so a, um, a little a short sequence of, of an actor that has been synthesized. Um, so what we want to do is to bring that, down those costs um, enormously and to democratize uh, visual effects. So to be able to have you know, much shorter training sequences, um, less amount of data, and be able to generate new video and to edit this new video in a way that will you know, allow creators to, to do something, something new and something creative. Um, and the other part is, you know, I think a lot about, for instance, e-learning. Um, so, you know, if you want to, if you want to, to do a course for, for teaching, um, at the moment, you know, most courses are in English. And so everybody around the world will listen to these courses in English. But what if you could just, you know, automatically uh, synthesize new video in lots of different languages, then you will be able to reach out to countries and developing countries where, for instance, you know, people don't speak the language, but they can really relate to the, the person who's teaching them if they can see them and they can watch them um, in, in their own language. So I think, you know, the potential for applications is, is enormous, really. Yeah, for sure. I want to look maybe 20 years into the future. Um, kind of two-pronged question about this future stuff. So one, how will 
having more access to synthetic data change the kinds of applications that companies can look at, like change the business side of things, but also um, like what will the data be like? What Will we still be looking at the same kinds of questions? Um, so yeah, it's a great question. I, I think uh, the 20 years from now, the first thing we kind of have to solve, and I think the first step is computer vision when it comes to simulation, but I think uh, what we'll find is that as GPUs become more powerful and the simulations and the renderings are more photorealistic, uh, you'll start getting into the physics, and that's where sort of robotics will shine. Uh, and then I think once you can, you know, in, in 10, 20 years, once you master that part, then oh my goodness, I mean, I think the future of all AI will be in simulation at that point, if you can really get to the perfect physics level of, of simulating all of the interactions and effects there. Because why, why risk damaging like a half a million dollar robot without doing any training on it, right? Like, do it in simulator first, do all that. So I think the future is going to sort of be trying to see how you can push the boundaries of the simulation, especially in the physics. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I would like to actually to elaborate on what Dale has said here. Uh, yeah, this, this is another field of applications for synthetic data that we have not yet touched upon, maybe because none of us is really working in the field, but that's definitely robotics. Robotics and reinforcement learning in general. So in, in just to give a bit of a background in reinforcement learning, you have an agent which operates in an environment, and the agent learns, the agent trains by actively doing things in the environment and getting responses from the environment. So for example, a robot learns to pick up bottles by actively trying to pick up the bottles because you cannot really have a training data set for this. And uh, uh, in, in this kind of settings, you simply cannot do without synthetic data. And for, for, for you cannot, uh, you cannot let a robot, for example, you can, have, uh, you can have a model play chess with itself for a few million times and then it will learn to play chess, that's how they do it now. But uh, you cannot let a physical robot pick up the bottle a million times. There will not be enough time and money to do that. So you really need to have some kind of a simulation environment for this and the simulation environment will have to be synthetic and of course in the future, and actually I hope in the more near future than 20 years, uh, we will have uh, uh, we will have truly, you know, uh, well, not may maybe not true physics, but we will have uh, sufficiently good simulation environments that we will be able to train all the robots, all the self-driving cars. It's the same idea. You cannot, you know, learn not to hit pedestrian pedestrians by trial and error. That wouldn't really work. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, so we will have the simulation environments. I think that's the logical next step of synthetic data, and it will drive a really societal change in how we see AI and how we use robots and, and so on. Other than that, I think 20 years is way too big. <laughs> it's, it's way too long a time to, to give predictions. There are serious people who believe that we will develop strong AI in 20 years. <laughs> so I, I think that yeah, maybe what you have both said is, um, is is the right direction. I mean, in 20 years' time, we will probably have simulated the whole world, right? <laughs> we will have um, maybe captured the geometry of the whole world. So right now, you know, that there are many different projects where they are going around the world, taking images, LIDAR, and reconstructing super accurately everywhere in the world. Um, and you know, if you can you can build all these all these three D models of the world, um, if we can get better at simulating physics, for instance, which is maybe an area that you know is still probably not not completely, um, it hasn't developed as much. Um, then you know, as soon as we can simulate the whole world, then then we can start training systems for you know maybe doing things that we haven't done at the moment. I think the key that thing here is that. You know, to generate synthetic data, we need to have models. So we need to we need to know, for in, for instance, how an image is formed. Um, we need to we need to kind of in in the models we need to capture all the variability of the data, and that's where the challenge is going to be. Uh, so we'll be improving our models for generating the data, but also, you know, how can we also better learn to transfer what's 
so how to transfer from the, the characteristics of, of reality into our synthetic data. So how to do that domain adaptation in a much better way. Right. Just synthesize the whole world. It's so yeah. easy enough, right? Well, not easy, but uh, <laughs> it will be done. It will be done. Uh, I mean, right now, you, you just have to, to look at Google Maps. I mean, you know, just in, in, a, in, in a few years, it's incredible. You can look at your house and you can see every little detail of your house, right? Um, so more and more, you know, all this data is being collected and, uh, and we are creating models of the whole world. So... We, we need to understand better how, you know, light bounces off each surface to create new images, for instance. Um, and as soon as we understand this a bit better and we can make better, better models for generating the data, uh, we'll be able to, to train for new things. I have one last feature-related question, your favorite. Um, I think for, for the average person, just the you know, average person walking down the street, um, they might not know immediately what synthetic data means. It's sort of the spectra, specter that e exists beyond the things that they interact with directly, as I've sort of touched on earlier. So how will synthetic data affect the average person's life? What will their life be like in 20 years? <laughs> well, I, I can repeat the same answer that uh, it will re I really believe that synthetic data will drive robotics. And then when you have robots able to, you know, uh, able to perfectly manipulate objects and to help you out with, you know, your uh, chores at home and to uh, all, all the cars will be self-driving and, you know, the, the world will change when we have robots that can really manipulate the physical world. Because as soon as we have that, they will probably just due to the sheer scale of, of this will become cheap enough and then... Uh, and, and, and then everything will be done by robots, and that's it. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like to joke that uh, like we uh, AI Reverie makes AAA video games that nobody plays, and then maybe in the future people will play them. Uh, but no, I, I really think that um, you know a simulation is essentially an acceleration technology. It, it accelerates computer vision. It accelerates AI. It's a thing that's going to make it a lot faster to develop better algorithms around. And I really look at it as almost like a, a primary scientific tool, almost as important as a microscope, as a way to open up new areas of research, to open up new ideas, content creation, all of that stuff. It's, it's just an amazing piece of technology. And I think the earlier we're sort of investing in, the more we start thinking about it, the faster we'll move forward. So I think, I think users have been interacting with synthetic data and synthetic media for a long time. You know, people play computer games and they immerse themselves in computer games. And computer games, you know, they still haven't reached that, that gap of really looking absolutely fully realistic, right? Um, There's they're, they're still that uncanny valley where um, the, the, the simulations that we see in computer games, they're not, they're not quite right there yet. Um, and I think maybe this is another area where, you know, very soon we're going to have augmented reality goggles and uh, maybe VR experiences, um, synthetic media in the form of video, where everything has been synthesized and it looks absolutely real. And I think people want that and people like that because they want to relate to the characters that they play with. They want to, to relate to, you know, they want to be able to maybe, you know, create content in a way that's much more realistic and that uh, they can they can relate to the characters much more. Or for instance, you know, sit at home and uh, wear your goggles and be able to have a conversation with your mum who's sitting in another country and you're having coffee together and you can really, you know, have an avatar of that person who that's sitting right next to you and you can interact with. I think synthetic media will, will allow us to do all of this. Awesome. Well, 20 years sounds pretty good. Uh, thank you all so much. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Okay. Yes, we do. Yes, questions. Uh, Mike's on the side, one over there. there. To your left, Samir. And a couple hands. Hi, uh, Samir Kumar from M12. So I, I really love the optimistic point of view on the potential of synthetic data. And you know the question about what is life like going to be like in 20 years, and for the average person who's not in machine learning, who's not in computer vision. 
So we can't ignore the pace at which deep fakes are advancing. And just in the last few years, uh, if you look at, you know, this person is not real, this apartment is not real, uh, these sites that are available to the public to show them, you will have a very difficult time distinguishing objective reality from what is fake news or synthetic data. So I guess the question would be for synesthesia and for AI reverie, you are taking the latest advances in synthetic data, building commercially viable tools and products and services, and making those available to customers. So I guess what kind of controls are you putting, or, and how much do you care about what your today and future customers may want to do with the capabilities that you're offering? Yeah, so I can address, uh, let me address not so much in the deep fakes because we don't, we're not involved in that particular aspect of it, but maybe something about public security and, you know, CCTV stuff. So I think one of the things that are actually, I actually think synthetic data can act as an opportunity to create an additional layer of privacy. So personally, from my, my opinion, uh, we don't believe in things like general surveillance, tracking people's faces, storing them in a database and doing things like that. But I actually think if you were to create a system that alerts people and says that something very violent or there's like, you know, we can all agree in a public space that somebody's walking around with an AK-47 is not something we might want. Um, but that can actually act as a layer for privacy too. It can act as a way to say, okay, authorities are only allowed to look at the CCTV when that alert comes on, rather than the sort of carte blanche ability to sort of look at all that data. You know, so I think we can actually create better insights and analytics to then sort of enforce a sort of protection around those kinds of things. Um, so that's just one example, and I'm happy to talk more about that as well. But I think we can, you know, we as a society have to decide, right? Because this is technology that's so powerful, and we have to have a debate about this. But I think we can be very thoughtful about our civil liberties and the protections around those things while creating important technologies that serve the public good. So I can, I can talk a little bit about the, um, the deep fakes that, that you were talking about from the synthesia point of view. Um, so we, we really, really don't like that word, actually, deep fakes, um, because we, you know, we, we're not really trying to generate fakes. And uh, one of the, we're trying to attack that in a, in a few different ways. So one of the things that, that we do is that we, had a, we have, I said before, we have a, an, an ethical, uh, we have ethical guidelines um, and we have made ethical statements. So for instance, you know, in our company, we will never apply the technology uh, to anyone who hasn't given their consent. So anyone who will be using Synthesia technology, uh, so we, we will be providing it to, um, they need to, to sign an, an agreement that, that yes, they're, they're happy for us to use their image and they're happy for us to produce these videos. Um, so, you know, in that way, we can, we can always guarantee that we're, we're never going to take any videos from politicians and change what they're saying. Um, but there are there are other aspects as well. We're also getting involved in in fake detection. Um, so we're working, for instance, with uh, AI Foundation and one of our other co-founders, Matthias Niesner. He's a he's a pioneer in in detecting fakes, right? So detecting tech, so creating technology that can look at videos and can detect whether that's a fake or not. Of course, that's a bit of an arms race, you know, you, 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 you win for a bit and then the fakes get a bit better and then you win again and then, um, but at least, you know, I think it's, it's important that, that we do actually engage with that because um, we're, using our, we're using our data to really better understand what, what, what fakes actually look like and uh, to be able to detect them. But at the same time, I think we, we also need to we, we also need to raise this issue, right? And uh, we also need to, for instance, you know, maybe authentication is another important thing. So when we create new media, when we create new images, when we create new video, perhaps what we should be doing is, you know, having some, some watermark or some, some kind of code uh, that, that's there and that, that actually relates to the authenticity of that video and where that video actually came from, something that can't be broken. Um, so, you know, we, we're engaging in all of those aspects. And uh, as a company, we, we take this ethical issue incredibly seriously. Um, and we, we can't just hide away. We really need to attack these questions. Yeah, uh, if, if I can. Did you want to say something real quick? Yeah, I, I did. I, I just wanted to add some, you know, admittedly naive and technocratic perspective to this. Uh, I think it's really pointless to try to restrict progress. And it's usually the 
technological progress that drives societal change rather than the other way around. Like th throughout our history, if you can, uh, if you look through it, the loot dice usually lose at the end. So, in, and usually technology makes our life better, not worse. For example, let's let's take your question to the extreme. Let's say that tomorrow somebody develops a cheap way to fake any possible video. So you, you can immediately and pretty inexpensively create a video which is indistinguishable from reality. What's going to change? Well, the, the obvious answer is now you cannot rely on videos to prove things, right? So now, like, a, a court cannot admit a video as a proof. You cannot, uh, I don't know, a video will not be enough proof to say that, I don't know, your wife is cheating on you or something. But Okay, will it change the society? Yes. Will it change it for the worse? I'm not sure. Why? I think that actually just about ran out of our time. Um, apologies to other people who had questions, but uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for all of their Thank information. You. Thank you very much, everybody. That was great. Um, much appreciated. Yeah.